Hey everyone, it's Jen Hatmaker. Welcome to the For the Love podcast. So as we close out our transition series, we're going to be looking at all the ways a chosen transition impacts our lives. So the one and only Jennifer Garner has made many transitions in her life, including a shift from acting to entrepreneurship and advocacy. So we're going to chat about what she learned all along the way, including several pivots that she has made in her life and career, how she faced the fear of the unknown and why big changes often have big results. Hey everybody, Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. So right now we are wrapping up a series called For the Love of Transitions. And it has been, for me, fascinating to talk to these incredible people really all along the spectrum of change. Some of them created change in their lives. Some of them experienced change that they didn't ask for and then had to figure out what to do with it. But I've learned so much from my guests in this series. If you have missed a single episode, I am urging you to go back and pick them up. You will not be sorry. So today you are here listening to the very last episode of our transition series. What a delightful hour you are about to have listening to this little show. Before I get to her, I just, I want to say a big thank you to all of the guests in this series who have been role models and demonstrated how it is to navigate these periods of change well. I'm just really sincerely thankful. I heard so many important takeaways over the course of this series, so many things that challenged me and inspired me and motivated me and encouraged me as I've gone through my own changes this year and continue to. And I hope it's been the same for you. And I think it is because I've been hearing from you loud and clear on this series, what these guests have meant to you. And so I literally couldn't be more pleased to wrap it up with someone who is not just like beloved to, well, I guess the world, but also has become a friend to our little podcast community. We interviewed her when her movie yesterday came out and she's back to talk about what it has been like to deliberately make a change that comes from your heart. Maybe not what anyone expected from you, maybe not even what you expected of yourself, maybe things you didn't see coming, but how to face those down with resolve and with passion and agency over what it is you're choosing and why. And so, of course, get excited, America, because Jen Garner is back on the show. And this conversation is real fun because we are just all in here. Super, super excited to to get to talk to her again. But Before we dive into the convo, just in case you have been living squarely, squarely under a boulder, let me give you a little rundown of Jen's amazing career. Of course, as you know, she's been in a zillion movies, like beloved movies from Juno, 13 going on 30, Love, Simon, that's a hat maker fave, Yes Day, which we talked to her about last time she was on here. And then of course alias and easy peasy. Jen's also won a Golden Globe Award, Screen Actors Guild. She has four consecutive primetime Emmy Award nominations. So it's going okay for her. I think she's doing okay. She's going to talk about this today, but she also decided to mix some things up in her life and started genuinely pouring herself into work with Save the Children, and then building this little business into this incredible operation now called Once Upon a Farm. If you follow her on social media, you know all about this. So we're going to talk about what led her to those places, some of the transitions that got her all the way there. There is a moment where she describes sleeping on the floor of a stranger's kitchen in New York City because she was making $150 a week. So I'm just saying it's all in here, you guys. It was... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> hearing her tell her own stories. There's no substitute. Also, by the way, if you haven't watched her fake cooking show videos on Instagram, you're just missing out. She just did a chicken soup video. And when she tried it, she just said, yes, Lord. And this is the kind of energy I think we need. So who knew that we would be watching this darling actress cook for us and entertain us with her witty humor. I mean, she is, (laughs) 
She's really delightful. And I think she's just as wonderful as we all think. Isn't that great to know? Don't you love when that happens? Just as wonderful as we think. And so today we talk parenting, we talk risk, we talk outlook on life, we talk changes, transitions, failures, lessons. It is in here and more. You guys are going to love You're going to love it. You already love her. So please just absolutely enjoy this delightful conversation with the incomparable Jen Garner. Hi, Jen. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so delighted to see you again. I can't believe that we're not together. That's what's really annoying me that you're having this, this main experience and I'm just in my dumb old office in LA. Have you been to Maine? I'm sure you have. I have been. My parents are sailors and they did all the islands of Maine. And I I met them up there and kind of bopped around islands and jumped into that freezing water and loved it. It's magic, isn't it? Like I'd never ventured this far up to the corner and the sailor people are real people. Like I didn't realize your parents were sailors. Did you grow up on boats like that? I grew up, my dad, you know, my dad's an Aggie. He grew up in, well, in Baytown, Texas. And then he would go to Galveston and do these sailing regattas on these little boats. And he just, it really defines my father, his love for the ocean. And so we had a 23 foot, a 23 foot boat, sailboat that we shared with another family. So every other weekend it was ours. It was in the Chesapeake Bay. We were in West Virginia. That was eight hours. We would drive eight hours every other weekend to get on that five of us on a 23 foot boat to go out. (laughs) And sometimes we would do all of our vacations in the summer, you know, three weeks, two weeks. We really hunkered down on that boat. So I have togetherness, every every crab cake spot, every ice cream up and down the Chesapeake Bay, every river, Tangier Island, all Smith Island, all the little nooks and crannies. I love it. Uh, it's so dreamy. Like I get it now. I get the magic. I get the dazzle, razzle dazzle, which is a, a low grade razzle dazzle. It's not when I first got here, you know, I'm up here for three weeks and it, I, I realized in the first, I'm going to say 10 minutes that I packed entirely wrong, a, a whole huge suitcase of worthless clothes. I've got it hanging in the closet, a bunch of cute shirts. Why? Why? I've worn this same long sleeve baseball t-shirt. I think 10 days, I I really misjudged. It's a laid back, casual, super friendly vibe that I just, I wasn't expecting it. Do you have a favorite spot, like kind of up this direction that you just go, that's the place that I want to dock the 23 foot boat? Gosh, I mean, I spent a lot of time in Cambridge while Ben was making movies when our kids were really, really little once with a, I think both times it was with a four month old with a three month old. And so that's not quite as far North, but my, I have a big soft spot for walking the streets of Cambridge with a baby Bjorn. That's so sweet. (laughs) Those little flashes of memories from the baby days. They're so foggy. They only come in patches. You know, I had my, you and I had kids in a similar, I had my boom, 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 three in a row, two years apart, all. Ugh. And it's such a, a, a hazy fog. I mostly I look back on it with rose colored glasses, which memory gives you that luxury. But yeah, you, I do. Re- you know, I don't remember the first year of my third child's life. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I was so overwhelmed. I barely remember the just the entire first year. I don't know. I, I think I shot Dallas Buyers Club at some point in there, but other than that, I, I was just in a fog. Uh, an absolute fog. I am so happy. That was right. When I had my third kid, that was 2002. And so that was right when normal people started having phones in our that we put in our pockets. And they turned out to also be cameras. And so I was so happy for my new fancy expensive camera phone that I could snap a few pictures of Caleb because also... I can barely even remember him actually being born out of my body. I mean, it's uh, the whole thing. It's just like, it's just a haze. I remember thinking the third kid's going to get zero of me. 
I've got a two-year-old. I've got a four-year-old. I hope the third one makes it. You know, I hope that they, I hope he's a survivor. Toss some Cheerios on the ground. There's food on the floor. We call it floor food. Like I, I hope that's enough. And I remember though, when the bigs finally went to kinder and they were in school and then it was just Caleb and I, and he's four and he actually got the most of me. I looked at that kid when he's four years old and the bigs are out of the house. I'm like, well, what's your deal? Hey, what can we do? I'm like, we're not going to McDonald's, buddy. It's just me and you. I taught him to love sushi. Like he's my most adventurous eater because we are not going to Burger King. <laughs> anyway, I loved that year with him because he was like, you know, went to the bathroom by himself. And it was, I was just like, you know what? By the time you have four-year-olds on up, they're like in college. Uh, that's how it felt at the time. Yep. <laughs> Get apartments, you guys. Good jobs. Okay. So here's my question because I don't I honestly know the answer. How did you go from being the the daughter of an Aggie p- part-time sailor and this like family having this little sweet connected life to just being just as, as weirdly as weirdly famous as a as a person could possibly be on planet Earth? That's not a straight path from like A to B. And I, I honestly don't know how you did that. How did you, did you know you wanted to do that? No. You didn't? No, no, no. I don't know how that, I mean, it is, it is such a strange journey. I mean, I, I really, I've been reflecting on it a lot because 20 years ago, this next week, we started after the pilot was picked up the first season of Alias. And that was the beginning. So I feel like, wow, I've had, I look at these dodos, that's what my kids call the paparazzi. And I look at them outside my house and I think, (laughs) wow, I've had these dodos for 20 years. 20 years. Mm. You know what? Mm. I'm over it. I want them to go haunt someone else. I am, I am, I'm over it. I'm done with them. Gosh, I, yeah, big done. You know, that thing, like do what you love. I really and truly could not be on stage enough as a kid. It's where... I differentiated myself from my brilliant big sister and my incredible little sister. And it's, it's kind of just where I found my community as much as anything. And I always felt pretty confident when I got onto, onto a stage. Like I, I think in my fourth grade talent show, I told a story. I told a tall tale that I'd memorized and I knew I had them the whole time, you know, and I, I don't remember if if I won or not, but I just knew that I knew the kids were with me. I knew they understood me. I knew that I was projecting. I, you know, I knew all, I just got all of that part of it. So it just kept, it kept, that kept being who I was and such so much that my mom was kind of, when I was a chemistry major, at some point, my mom was just like, Jennifer, why don't you just study what you love? You can be anything later, but this is what you're doing with college. So just do it. But then after college, when I had spent every summer working in summer stocks, cleaning the toilets, hanging the lights, you know, ironing the clothes. And my mom said, whatever you do, if you move to New York, it's a smaller move than me moving and leaving the little farm that I grew up on. So just do wow. it. I'm not scared for you. You can do it. And she was right. Mom it was said that. You know, yeah. Oh, I love that she said that. Did you think you were going to stay on the stage? Did you think for a while, I want theater, I want plays, that's, I mean, I'm going to Broadway. I'm, what is that? That's where you thought your, your path was, not film? I, for sure. I mean, growing up, it was all, it was ballet, but I was never going to be a professional ballerina. And then it was musical theater. And I'm not sure that I ever, you know, now that I'm old, now I feel like my next chapter is going to be playing the fun little old ladies in the musicals. <laughs> <laughs> but that we, I'm not quite there, but I was never going to be, you know, Sutton Foster or Kristen Chenoweth or Kelly O'Hara or one of my idols. Instead, when I got to college and discovered plays, I, I could have just studied dramatic literature and nothing else and been in heaven. I just could not, I had these incredible professors who, you know, would do a seminar on Ibsen just because I loved it or who would, you know, go just deep on LGBTQ, although it wasn't all of those letters back then, drama or just all like modern drama checkup. So I really thought that that's what I was going to do is I thought I'd live in Atlanta or, you know, in, in 
at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis and have kids and, you know, just work as a in a in a kind of a company of actors. And by the way, I would have been perfectly happy. I would still be perfectly happy doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you then what happened? How, how did it how did it turn out that you all of a sudden were you became Sydney and then you became Jen Garner, who the whole world knows, because that's a pre pretty big departure from the stage. Yeah, I was understudying a play in New York. I had gone there uh, just to visit friends and from a theater I'd worked at in a strip mall in Florida called the Brian C. Smith Off-Broadway Theater that was like, I think he laundered tax money, money for taxes there. <laughs> that tracks. And, that feels right. Yeah. yeah. So I'd gone to visit those friends that I'm, I'm still friends with and they Anyway, I was staying with them and they said, oh, here's a backstage. If you want just something to do today, just try a couple of auditions. I went on them. I got everything that I went on because I had that fresh off the bus, uh -huh. totally. you know, hi, I'm Jen, you know, <laughs> so for sure. And they said, well, maybe you should meet an agent and see if you should take one of these. I was there to audition for Utah Shakespeare, which I also got, but which I, this was a, like one of the turning points. I didn't take it. Instead, during that week, I got a job understudying a play on Broadway. It was a Virginia play, Month in the Country, and it was Helen Mirren and F. Murray Abraham and my beloved Ron Rifkin and Alessandro Navolo and Katie Irby. And so I got to watch eight shows a week of these people performing. It was incredible. But I was paid $150 a week to do that job. And it was full time. I didn't have time to go to the restaurant. So I bounced a check at a Dwayne Reed when I had a cold and I wanted cold medicine and Kleenex. Oh my gosh. Okay. So at the time, okay, I'm <laughs> living, I was living on a woman's kitchen floor sure. that I found off of Actors Equity Bulletin Board, called her up, living on her kitchen floor. I had a hostess job, but I could never get there because we were you know, at the theater. And I got a cold and I got broke and I was walking. I couldn't afford the subway token. So I was walking back and forth from 85th to the theater at, in Times Square and then back up. And I bounced this check at Dwayne Reed. I finally had to call my dad. I didn't know how Dwayne, how bounce checks worked. I got kind of far behind. I had to call my dad and ask for like $400. I was so embarrassed. And my sweet parents help they, they were kind of shocked they bailed me out and during that time somebody said you could go do this screen test for this mini series to play melissa gilbert's daughter in a danielle steel mini series and i said i can't leave the theater and they said we'll make it on a monday and we will give you per diem cash oh well that was like 45 free dollars it was a hundred yeah and i needed oh, that well golly cash. so yeah, you I, did flew to LA where I'd never been, did the screen test, got the job. And then I came back with that money. And then I had to leave the show. I had to leave my understudy job. Anyway, that's the whole story. So then once I had done that, I, then I realized all the girls on Broadway were on TV or on in movies, in the plays that I wanted to do. So I just kind of scuttled around. And then one thing led to did a little pivot. Did your yeah. parents know you were sleeping on a lady's kitchen floor? They did not even back. I bet they didn't. Mm -mm. <laughs> they were like, let her go. She's headstrong. Yeah. Like we tell her, no, she's going anyway. That gives me a weird joy surge just to think of you like chasing down that $150 <laughs> a day per day. I'm like, well, hell, I'm just going to fill the coffers, you know, with this, with this opportunity. Did you relocate over to LA? Really at that point? I stayed in okay. New York and I actually, I worked a lot out of New York when I was, I mean, after every audition, I was starting from scratch every time. Cause I, I had, I knew no one. I knew nothing. I'd never been in front of a camera. I didn't want to be in front of a camera. I didn't, I remember Melissa Gilbert sweetly saying to me, you know, this is a mark. This is a call sheet. This is now we're going to turn the cameras around. She explained, she taught me. She was my filmmaker. Wow. She took That's the so time sweet. to say, this is a, a question you would ask the first AD. This is, I mean, she was really so generous and kind. Yeah. And then from there, I just kept almost getting these plays. And then I just kept getting like a Hallmark Hall of Fame miniseries or Hallmark Hall of Fame, whatever. And so, yeah, it just... 
you kind of headed started that up way. the wrongs. Yeah. So that's, I love to know that because at this point, then you have really kind of done almost every kind of thing, every kind of show, every kind of TV, a mini series, a huge series, film, action. I mean, there, I'm trying to think of a genre. Is there a genre you haven't hit? Scary? I haven't done a musical on oh, yeah, musical. film and I haven't done a thriller because I'm too susceptible to them. <laughs> Me too. Scripts. I can't even no. I can't watch them. I can't read the scripts. I just am, so I have, people are always like, why do you not do this? It's it, like, you could have a little action in there. I'm just like, too scary. I love, th- I love this. That's my, my favorite thing so far that you've said, because I have an irrational fear of scary things and scary movies. And two of my best friends are in Mexico right now. And they were telling, I was asking them, what am I going to watch at night when I'm by myself? And they were like, here's a new show. It's got Jason Bateman in it, who I love. His brand of humor is my favorite thing. So I'm thinking, Jason, it'll be it'll be charming and, and dry humor and everything I love. And then they come back and tell me, oh, no, abort, abort. It's scary. It's like, I said, is it, is it psychological? Is it like demons? They're like kind of all of that. And I said, well, you cannot watch shows like that. That is how the devil gets inside your heart. And then he's going to live there permanently, especially when you try to go to sleep. Jen. Yes. Yeah. I can't do it. And I know that great drama happens in these scary shows, but it is not happening for this girl. I will watch Cheers season eight all the way through again That's right. before I can dip into, I would love to watch Ozarks. I love Jason Bateman. I mean, I think he's one of the most talented people in the world. And I also adore him as a person. And I still, it's, I'm just like, yeah. It's yeah. a hard pass. That's going to be a, it's pass. a hard pass. You can't do that. Yeah. I'll be a person who throws her TV out the third story window before I resort to thrillers and psychological warfare like that. I won't do it. I just won't do it. I still, to this very day, I'm 46 years old and with great clarity, like incredible clarity, like it was yesterday. I remember watching Silence of the Lambs in the theater. And then of course I had to go to bed and sleep where I was certainly going to be murdered certainly. And so at 4 a.m., having not even shut my little eyes for one second, I finally went in and got my sister, Lindsay, who was three years younger than me. And I just drug her out of her bed and put her in my bed and wrapped myself around her because I thought she could protect me from the, you know, the killers and the, yeah, the the serial killers particularly. So yeah. Okay, good. So I'm never going to see you in that. And that thrills me because I wouldn't be able to watch you in it. Good. And I would be sorry to not be able to support your work, but I wouldn't do it. So you having now this, this incredible scope of work. I am really curious of all the, the projects you've done, including the environments that, that filming that, what your, your directors, your castmates, your, your location, the ethos of kind of the, the set. Do you have like a, one of your favorite memories where you're like, Record, doing this one project was like the most fun I've ever had. I loved my people. I loved getting up in the morning. I loved how it turned out. Do you have one of those that's kind of the North Star experience? I've been so lucky. I've had several, but I've had a couple of real, and one was definitely Alias. And that's just J.J. Abrams kind of in his prime, stepping into the world, into his role as director. He directed the pilot. It was the first kind of big thing he had he had directed. And it was so incredible to watch him become a director. And I was talking to him about it the other night and just saying, remember how you would just say, Jennifer, you need to go deeper. You have to you have to get there emotionally. And I would just be like, OK, bah! you know, just like his his direction was so powerful for for me. And I know now that that wasn't unique to me. That is something that he is such a connected person that That's his I magic. Think, you know, it's so fun to, to come across other people who have worked with them and to share that. And from JJ, I mean, so many of my very closest friendships come from that show. And, it, you know, I still work with the same dresser, the same driver, the same stunt woman as she's one of my very closest friends, the same. So I see that it's this little family of people who have been, we've been traveling together through life for 20 years. And that's, that's special. That's pretty dear. And Victor Garber, you know, and of the whole cast, we're all still, we're still really close. We shared something that was hard. It was hard to do. 
that is special and probably rare. How long did Alias go? It was five years. and It was only five years. It was just so intense. It was just like before they kind of got TV hours under control and before, it, you know, back when it was 22 episodes and we were just like, totally, you know, we're going to balls to the wall. And then the other one would be 13 going on 30. And that would really be because I discovered so much of myself making that movie. And that was really my relationship with Gary Winnick, our director who died because of brain cancer a while ago. And Judy, Greer and Mark Ruffalo. I mean, dream boats, really, dream. truly. Dream, dream. And of course, isn't it fun for you to see that that movie has cemented its place in like American national treasure archives. It is just such a favorite. And it was really, really fun to bring my daughters along. Of course, I saw it originally. And then the daughters grow up. I'm like, well, here's your new favorite movie. Get excited. And it just keeps going. It, it has a real long shelf life which is How fun is also that? special. How yeah. fun is that? It's yes. so fun to have little girls still be excited to totally. meet me because of 13 going on 30. I mean, what more could totally. you ask for? It oh, really, it's just luck. That's like, that has nothing to do with me. That's all Gary just being a cute angel up there. And Oh, I'm so happy you had that experience. I'm so happy to get to share that with my girls too. I never knew I would be so happy to see crowds that I walked into an airport to catch a flight to Maine, where I've been spending a few weeks this summer. Crowded is actually an understatement at the airports right now, you guys. Maybe you've been back out there and seeing the same. And while the lines and chaos aren't exactly the most fun, there is something so refreshingly normal about seeing them after last year. So here's what I recommend for those long airport waits. Best Fiends. Yes, it's a phone game. And yes, I'm obsessed. Thank you for understanding. It's colorful and creative and clever, and it's totally free to download. And Best Fiends releases new challenges, characters, and themes all the time just to keep you on your toes. And you are never repeating anything when you play. So just please don't blame me if you end up a bit too into Best Fiends. I want to create time to play more levels and challenges, even when you're not stuck in a line. So download Best Fiends. It's a five-star rated puzzle game for free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. It's no secret that I think therapy is such a hugely important part of life for all our lives, really no matter what season we're in. I am at my own best when I stay committed to my regular therapy sessions because even the good, bright, or delightfully carefree times need attention. Not just the darker ones or the ones where we find ourselves in a deep chill of hibernation. But what you may not know is that I meet with my therapist virtually. Um, online counseling works so well for me because I can do it from home. I don't have to get dressed up, get in the car, get stuck in traffic, look for parking to make my appointments. I just turn on my computer and boom. That's one of the big reasons I love BetterHelp because it is professional therapy that is fully virtual and online. Their licensed counselors have a broad range of expertise categories like specializing in everything from depression, stress and anxiety, relationships, trauma, anger, family conflict. So you can start communicating with a therapist in under 24 hours and you'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is also committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. And that's why they also make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. I cannot encourage you more in this for whatever season you're walking through. BetterHelp is such a good, good way to get started. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash for the love. Join more than 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash for the love. All 
I really am super interested and proud of you for this new season two that you've added on this new layer of once upon a farm and your work with save the children. And I just like to hear you talk about a little bit, what drew you here? I'm curious how these have found their way into like the beating core of your heart. Cause they, it seems like they really have. For sure. Well, save the children. I went looking for both of them. I went looking for, but I'll start with save cause it's been around the longest. And I really wanted to know who was helping kids like my mom, you know, who grew up poor in Oklahoma or like the kids I'd grown up in, with in West Virginia, who was helping them get a leg up and have, you know, I, I know we were very clear that our lives were shaped by our parents' just education and that education changed their lives and changed the trajectory of ours and what was possible for us. And it just bothered me being little in West Virginia and seeing kids that I just thought I I know that she's smart. So why did she get held back? And I can see that his, the front of his shoes are cut open to make room for his toes. And I can see it. There's something very not fair here. So once I did have a voice, there was just like, it finally came back to what can I speak about with the most authenticity and what can I, where do I connect to? And can I, I guess I, I was pregnant with my second daughter. And so can I, as a mom of little kids, really service an organization in Africa? That too, you know, because how you do anything is how you do everything. So I wasn't going to just put my name on something and I, and I wasn't going to, I, I didn't, I'm not good. I wasn't good at just being like, I'll see you kids. I'm going to go to wherever for a couple of, you know, I mean, God bless everyone. That is not something that I thought that I would be good at doing. So yeah, so I hunted down what organization was really doing work in rural America and save the children all over the world. Our, our whole global goal is to help kids where no one wants to go and where no one's helping them. So we are in Afghanistan. We do. We're always in the middle of the Ebola crisis. We're always in the middle of, you know, like catching kids as they're leaving Syria. And and we're in those refugee camps and we're in disasters and where we are hand in hand with the Red Cross and just kind of one of the leading organizations helping kids in the whole world. And in the U.S., the work is so beautiful. And it's almost unknown because we're in the little tucked away corners. Totally. I think like food insecurity and poverty in America, it's it's a little bit invisible because we want it to be. You know, we choose what we look at. And so it is in some ways easier to look across the globe and see it somewhere else in a country that is so differently cultured than ours or with such obvious distinctions. But the food insecurity in America is high, 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 which of course, you know. Of course, it's really high. And also we're talking about kids who, by the time they enter kindergarten, they are so far behind and it's so hard to grasp because it's like, what do you even mean? Why would you be behind going into kindergarten? But when you're in the homes and there is no talking, no babbling, no, there's, there's the, when you see, if you think about the times in your life where there's so much stress, you can't see out from under your own eyelids to to get things done and to be your own engine, take that and then times 10 it because you're alone and you have no experience other than being isolated in poverty. So where is food coming from? There are drugs around. Where are you going to sleep? Pipes are bursting and the, the broken steps outside your home are frozen. So it's just problems compound upon problems. And then the country is judging you because we're a pull yourself up by the bootstraps country. You're just screwed. So you're not talking to your baby. It's never been modeled for you. There are no books in your home. There are no crayons in your home. This baby is just existing. And then they're being sent to kindergarten without ever having stood in line, without ever having held a book, without ever, or if not without ever, then not enough. You know, think of the repetition that it takes for a child to reach for a book, sit on your lap and know how to turn pages. When you hold a child and you give them a book and they don't know what to do with it, you just think, wow. So that's what 
so much of our country looks like. And it, you know, early Head Start reaches less than 5% of kids that are eligible. Head Start reaches about 35%. There aren't options for parents out there and they haven't been educated and kind of empowered to give their own kids that kind of experience. So we just do a really, I say we, as if I have anything to do with it. Save the Children just does a bang up great job with it and fills in they just do. They do. And food insecurity as well. And that is where Once Upon a Farm comes in because I've worked with Mark Shriver at SAVE for all these years. And he said to me a long time ago, because a lot of what we do is advocacy and at the state and federal level for policy change. And he said, you know, it's funny, business is really pushing philanthropy as much as government is. And you need businesses to invest back into their communities. So I always felt frustrated that there weren't enough businesses. I mean, we have TJ Maxx, Ulta Beauty, incredible, incredible. But I felt like, why is everyone not obviously giving to the kids around the corner that save the children? And I just had this dream of that some little business I would be a part of would get enough of a foothold that we could be meaningful givers. <laughs> and we are, we're getting, I mean, that's happening. That's happening. It's happening. I know. I just want to hear more. I want to hear how that, the origin story of this exact idea, because it is, I mean, from this, from the big screen to the earth, to the dirt, to tractors. I mean, this is the, this is kind of the gritty stuff of production and creativity. It's just in a different way. Uh, you're creating different things. And so I love that this was where you went with your head. I love this. This is what you chose. It's kind of at the intersection of several needs. And so can you talk about its early beginnings, what you have learned? Because it's meaningful work to, to turn the soil and to grow beautiful things. It's, it's so metaphorical. It's so physically transformational, mentally transformational, and then obviously communal transformation, which you're putting it towards. So I just kind of want to hear you talk about it. I gardened, I grew like tomatoes and such and peppers and okra for years in my little backyard. And I never at one point was it not a miracle to me. And I thought, when can I get some chill? When, what I year is it going to be that I act normal? Yeah. By the way, I've lived in California for 20, I don't know, over 20 years, I think. A long time, 24 years. And I cannot get over that lemons grow on trees here. I can't get over that you can have one in your house, in your yard. I, I just like right here is a list of, you know, fruit trees that I am excited to put an order in for because I'm so I just get it. freaking jazzed by it. I'm so it's easily so excited by all of it. You know, <laughs> I want to like carry the computer out and show you my garden right now because I'm so happy about my kale and my, my butternut squash. Totally. I, I mean, used to open it. up my sandwich. Somebody come over and open my sandwich like, I grew that tomato and I pulled it out of the ground and I'm eating it right now. Just that is how it works. But it kind of skipped our generation. You know, we got our food from the grocery store. And so this well, see, sort of I return. Didn't, though. That's the difference. Oh, yeah, that's that right. My mom yeah, never knew. fell for Tang. She never fell for oh, little Debbie her. or for Pringles. <laughs> and let me tell you, I wanted them you so badly. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. ate out mad. her beautiful homemade food for a little Debbie snack cake faster than... I mean, I would do anything. And the same with my homemade dresses. I just, but my mom really did grow up on a farm and she brought that, you know, she brought that. We always had, like you said, a big garden. We always had, and she always said, you kids, if I cook these veggies and put them in front of you, you want nothing to do with them. But if I tell you to go out there and pick the green beans, I'll find you 15 minutes later eating as many as you can. So who cares? It's getting in that, you know, it's just different when it tastes like the sun. So we always were a farmer's market family, you know, everything was homemade, organic, whatever. So food has always made sense to me in that, you know, food is love kind of way. It's funny, I I had not put this together until like today, I was thinking about it for some reason, maybe talking to you, but I was shooting this movie, The Kingdom with Jason Bateman. And my daughter was, my first was eight months old. She was learning to crawl, I remember. And I was pumping, nursing, shooting an action movie in the desert and trying to make homemade freaking baby food. 
And Easy. back then you have to rinse this out and you have to do, and I'm like trying to figure out what nutrients should she have? How long, how long has this been in the freezer of this rental? Is it safe still? Is it, you know, it kind of starts to look gross. So <laughs> when I heard about Once Upon a Farm, that was tiny at the time. And then I met John Foraker, who was an, an angel investor. And he and I had this incredible first conversation. He was, he had built Annie's. He was now working. He had sold Annie's to GM. We all know Annie's. And I kind of was like, why are you into this tiny company? Because I'm, I'm kind of into it. And he said, why are you into it? And I said, I'm into building a company that helps accessibility for all kids to this level of nutrition. And uh, granted, you have to build the company and, the, and you know, work on that. And he was like, I'm into that too. And he left his company and we shook hands and said, I'm in if you're in. And that was it. Oh my gosh. How long ago was that? That was 2017. So what's happened with it since? Like at 2017, this is what it looked like. And in 2021, this is what it looks like. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. It's so fun. What's happened is that we've gained the trust of moms across the country and that we have little kids who have grown up, you know, reaching for our, the farm, or the little barn on the front of our, our food and, and have grown up without sugar. I mean, oh my gosh, when I think of the sugar that I gave my kids, they have, we have no sugar added. We are totally plant-based. We are totally organic. We are clean. We have the purity award every which way to Sunday. We are, yes, still baby. That'll always be a huge part of our DNA, but we are kids. We are right there in the lunchbox where I've dreamed of being forever and just growing like crazy. Like That's in the, in the it's, it's just really fun and officially partnered with Save the Children. And we do have a WIC line to make sure that this level of nutrition is available. And so we've been kind of flipping state by state, trying to flip states because so few states even accept organic baby food or kids food. Make it make sense. It's so crazy. Yeah. So Working on that, working on making sure we're in, we're in a variety of retailers that with a variety of pricings and, you know, it's, it's all learning for me. I didn't know, I'd never taken one business class. I didn't know anything. Yeah. Yeah. Running a business is a whole deal. I can only imagine how you, cause you can strike out with vision. I'm like that. I'm a vision person. I'm big ideas. I'm a 35,000 foot view kind of thinker. And then it turns out to execute all that as a business person who has staff and that sometimes my team has to come to me and be like, so we've got a bottleneck and the bottleneck is named Jen Hatmaker. And I'm like, okay, yeah. Because that's a whole different muscle to flex. Have you learned to love the business part? Because some of it is not as fun as the idea part <laughs> or as the results part. I love the results part. That's my favorite space on the spectrum. But the, the middle part is a lot. Yes. Uh -huh. There was a moment there where we just had a couple of rough meetings at retailers. You know, at first, like John and I would be in these meetings all over the country talking to retailers about our food and we're educating, you know, why we need to be in refrigerated, what the difference is, why are we all into fresh pet and we think it's normal and we've allowed there to be a refrigerator in the pet food aisle. And then meanwhile, for our little babies, we're still basically feeding them cat food. Like why, why is this, why is this hard? But that's a whole, you know, in educating retailers, educating consumers, that's been a whole thing. But there was a minute where it looked like oh gosh, is this going to work? <laughs> is this going to work? Because all the early love of me showing up at these places it was wearing off and it was like, oh my gosh, is this going to work? And then we kind of, we, we had, I remember I went home from one of those and I got back here to this little office and I cried. And then he said, hey, buckle up. This is what it looks like. And I said, all right, I trust you. And by the way, that was, if that was the Nader, I'm sure we'll hit another one. I hope that I that he helps me be more resilient next time. But oh, yes, I do love that. I, I just, you know what I love? I love any community. I just like to be in a community. Yeah. And this yeah, is like one too. that I was part of building. And so I have all these buddies, you know, and I get to like ask them 
questions and they have to answer. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And there's something about the the buddies in the bunker with you. When you sort of started from square one, when you're just flying across the country with your zeal and, you know, and then the shine wears off the penny a little and, but you still got your, your guys, you got your people. I love those people. I, I hang on to them for dear life. I'm like you. I have all my same people from forever. There's no hope for them. They can't leave. They cannot escape my clutches. I won't, I won't have it. It's so special to build something beautiful with people that you love, that you can trust, that love you, that kind of grab you by the hand and pull you forward. Because I, I can be not resilient too when things wobble. My outlook on life in general is just glass almost all the way full, almost. And Me so too, when but the, a when wobble, the glass dips. Yeah, a wobble yeah. is almost harder for me than just dumping the glass out. Yeah, I know what you mean. I want to ask you this as we kind of start to wrap it up here. This series on the show is about transitions. And I've talked to you a lot about moments in your life where you have kind of moved from this to this, from this to this, from this to entrepreneur. One thing that you and I both know at our age is that at this point, we encounter these constant transitions in our life. And some of them we choose and some of them we don't. And yet there they are for us to figure out what to do with and how to manage and how we want to move through them and come out on the other side. And so I mean, it's kind of a, a large question, but when you look back, can you say, is there a, a particular transition when you move from this to this in your life, whether you picked it or didn't, that stays with you, that was super impactful to you, that really taught you something. It was a big teacher for you. And then what you ended up ultimately being grateful for. I don't know how you do with change, but change for most of us is hard. Change is hard. Yeah. Change, I mean, I have a tendency to kind of, or I did when I was younger, like I leaped into moving and in, living in New York before I thought about living in New York. And then I leaped into moving to LA and then had to absorb that. Wait a minute. I just left this all behind. I live here now. I live here. I don't know anyone. That was actually, that was probably Huge. That was a big transition for me because I didn't realize I had built a community for myself in New York. I, I had casting directors who were rooting for me and pulling, making my life better. I was part of, you know, a group of just up and comers. Yeah, I was kind of, I was thriving there. And all of a sudden something brought me out here, a pilot or something. And I had moved enough furniture, you know, like the secretary, my parents put in my room one Sunday morning while I was still asleep that I've had everywhere I've lived since then. And <laughs> suddenly it was in LA and it was like, oh, well, if this is here, I live here. <laughs> and I didn't like it. Code. I didn't like it. And I was stuck and I couldn't afford to go back. And I just was like, I remember giving myself a talking to and saying, you can either figure out what you like here and do it every day. So for me at the time, it was yoga, which I've never done since, but, and it, it was hiking and it was farmer's markets and those things I did religiously. And I said, you can either do that and start to invest or you can get over yourself and leave, but you may not complain about it anymore. Wow. How old were you when you moved there? I was 25. Yeah. That's pretty young to set out without a, a community to kind of fall on you were really wise to know what to reach for. If it wasn't people, what else could it be? I mean, if it wasn't success yet, what else could it be? I actually love when I see young adults do these, these sort of big risks, when they move somewhere by themselves, when they take a plunge that seems, you know, fairly ridiculous or some sort of risk. I, I'm always excited to see what they're gonna stay on the other end. It's almost universally good. I have been in my kitchen a lot this year working on my cookbook. While I was in the thick of recipe testing this year, I discovered ButcherBox. ButcherBox delivers the highest quality, humanely sourced meat shipped right to your doorstep. They have all kinds of options like 100% grass fed and finished beef, like free range organic chicken, and like sugar free, nitrate free bacon. Uh, just do it for the bacon alone, you guys. My boxes always include their bacon, plus ground beef for like weekly burger nights and sirloin steaks, strip steaks, chuck roast, chicken breast. It's literally the best tasting, 
best quality meat I found anywhere. Plus it saves you a trip, like multiple trips to the grocery store. Every butcher box box ships with nine to 11 pounds of product, it's all packed fresh, shipped frozen, and then vacuum sealed, making it super simple to either store in your freezer and just grab later if that's what you want. It's it's backyard barbecue season, friends. So now is the best time to stock up. And Butcher Box is going to help you celebrate summer with a surf and turf deal. So right now they're offering new members two free lobster tails and two free ribeyes in your first box. It's easy to sign up. Just choose between four curated box options or a custom box that lets you choose your favorite cuts. Then Butcher Box ships your order frozen at peak freshness and packed in a recyclable box. Okay. So remember, Butcher Box is giving you two five ounce lobster tails and two 10 ounce ribeyes for free in your first box. You can get this special deal when you sign up for a new membership at butcherbox.com slash for the love. So that's butcherbox.com slash for the love for free lobster tails and ribeyes in your first box. I don't know about you, but when I'm packing for travel, one of my least favorite things to figure out is the shoe situation. They're so bulky in suitcases and you have to bring your comfy pairs and your cute pairs both, and it just all takes up too much space. That's one of the reasons I always bring my Rothy's when I'm traveling because you feel like you are walking on clouds. So yes to all of this. If you're a Rothy's girl like me, have you checked out their handbags? And here's one more thing. Rothy's just launched a new men's shoe line that is also intentionally designed with an artisanal level of detail and created with nearly zero waste, just like all their products. Rothy's reduces their footprint, literally, by crafting shoes and handbags out of sustainable materials like hemp, as well as thread made from 100 million plastic water bottles. To help you welcome summer in style, Rothy's is doing something special. They gave me the chance to share this super rare opportunity with you for a limited time. So through August 1st, 2021, you can get $20 off your first purchase of $100 or more at rothys.com slash for the love. So that's rothys, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash for the love. Trust us. You don't want to miss this. Head to rothys.com slash for the love to find your new favorites today. Let me just land it with you here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to laugh with you. This is just a question that I always ask my guests, all of them, every series. And you can answer this, Jen, however you want. We get like really like earnest, darling answers and we get insane, absurd answers. And I love them all. So just whatever feels right. But it's a question that I learned from a priest that I love. And she says, what's saving your life right now? Mm -hmm. What is saving my life right now? Hmm. I mean, it's, isn't it? I mean, I can't imagine it ever being anything other than girlfriends. Uh. I just like, I can't, I mean, I can think beyond that to more unique or, but how do you get how do you get past that? I can't. Who are your best friends? Who do you love? Who are your best people? My best friends are, gosh, I'm so lucky. I work with so many of them. Uh -huh. but Nicole King, who I've worked with for 22 years since she was a baby peanut. And we, <laughs> raise, our, we raise our kids together and she's like, you know, sister. And Karina, who is my kid's godmother, she was my roommate when I finally got off the kitchen floor and into a real apartment. We we lived together in New York for those precious years. And I have two sisters. And, yeah, me too. And then my house mm -hmm. is populated with these incredible witchy ladies who are my <laughs> like my sisters and they are to each other, which is also so beautiful aside for me. And so I get to, you know, be with Mo oh. and... Noel and Cass. That's so great. Yeah. It's so great. I love women. I would just, I would just waste away in this world without my women. Yeah. 
Yeah. The I girls friend, in my life. My, my best friend from college, I think her real name's Laura Perrin, but I call her Grande. Grande just said the other day, I'm flying in to have dinner with you, period. And I'm leaving. I'm flying from Kansas City to sit across from you and have dinner. And I will be leaving the next morning. You can't see and me. And you will be having no choice. I yeah. will see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But she did. And it didn't, it didn't come with like, and I want three days and what do you want to do? And it was just like, this is what we're doing and I'm leaving and you don't have, you're not dealing with me anymore. And it was like, it was the biggest gift. I can't even imagine. I love this so much. You know, I'm up here by myself for these months. I've got two friends in Mexico for a month and one still in Texas where we live. And we were just texting each other right before you and I hopped on here. We are sisters truly. And I just said, this was just a terrible idea. Like, are we going to have to reintroduce ourselves when we see each other in August? We need name tags. We all live within 0.1 mile of each other, the four of us. But we just said, this is, this is a not natural. We've chosen an unnatural path. I'm like, we really, this is terrible planning. I mean, I miss my kids. Sure. But it's my girlfriends that I'm sending the memes to. Like I'm dying. I'm dying without you. Please fly here. Thank you for saying that. I've never had anybody say that. I've had a lot of episodes and I've never had anybody say girlfriends. And that's my favorite thing in the world. Thank you for this, Jen. I loved it. I loved yeah, it. Loved it. Loved it. See loved you later. It. Okay. Well, she's, you know, she's, she's dear and wonderful. Isn't she? dear and wonderful. Just, I love when incredible success happens to genuinely good people. It makes me so happy as if it happened to my own self. And Jen is one of those people just really love cheering her on in her life. I love how she uses her influence, her incredible fame. She's so generous and just like a, like a, just a normal person. That's awesome. <laughs> That can be her new bio, Jen Garner, a normal per person who's awesome. I hope you loved that. I hope you loved this whole series. I loved the transition series. Our guests in this series have meant a lot to me and really, I needed them, I think right now at this exact moment, I needed what they had to say. I needed their wisdom and what they've learned and where they've gone and where they're going and just feel really filled up to the brim after getting to host the series. I hope you loved it too. Go back and pick up any ones that you missed because you will not regret that. So, okay, you guys come back next week when we kick off a whole new series you're going to be excited about. You are going to enjoy. You are going to be moved by. We have an all-star lineup. And so it's just so fun to get to do this. I love it. I love it. Laura and her crew loves it. Amanda loves it. We love serving you like this. So happy to bring this to you week in and week out, you guys. Thanks for subscribing and rating and reviewing and sharing all the wonderful things you do to make this podcast like so, so special and beloved. You are the best community. All right, everybody. See you next week.